the Cat and Moose podcast. I'm Cat and I'm Moose. This is a true life podcast where we explore the quirks of being human. Socky pop 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 sucks pop 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 today Sock, hop, on my pop, fact app. Da, da, pop. I learned that there's 142,013 licks necessary to get to the Tootsie Roll in a Tootsie Pop. That is not true. Well, the fact app says it is on my phone. Well, your fact app is fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Let's find out. One, two, three, three. Okay, so we've done a couple of these episodes where people have hopefully gotten a chance to understand us and get to know our personalities, et cetera. But I thought it would be good for us to actually uh, share about ourselves. Okay. Because I don't, I know a lot of your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happens when you've known me for half of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I don't know if I know specifically the answers to these questions. Oh, good. Okay. And I don't have them prepared. Okay. They're, they're gonna come through my spirit. Okay. That out of sounds my mouth. Amazing. <laughs> my spirit gut. Okay. Your spirit so gut. um I would like to know, and we have lots of these, but is there a moment you can think of where um you were very embarrassed in front in front of a group of people? Yes. Um there is a friend of mine who and, and I tend to do this. I don't know why this happens to me in my life, but like I'm kind of a low life if we're being completely honest. Like I could live in a trailer, like I could not shower every day, like I could be one well, of those you would people. Choose those things? No, I'm just saying that I could handle being that way if that for some reason needed to be my way of life. But it seems like I choose people in my friends who are very classy, who are very like let's go to the the nice restaurant or let's have actual manners at the table and things like that. And I know how to, I know how to act like a high class person. I'm just not a high class person. <laughs> and so, um, so I was with one of my high class friends. She had invited me to a Christmas party at her house and, mm -hmm. um, and it was an ornament party. So it was kind of like a white elephant oh, thing. I know. And it's Wait, a, you make uh, ornaments. No, 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 you don't make ornaments. Everybody shows up with an ornament and oh, then it's gotcha. kind of like, like secret Santa or white yeah. elephant or whatever it is. So I went to this party and it was, it was a lot of these type of people who it's like, you know, they're all skinny. They're all like wearing cute clothes. And I'm just like, here I am like the water Buffalo in the room, you know? <laughs> and so, um, and so my friend that was throwing the party, she and her grandmother in law, um, would always exchange these ornaments and I don't, I don't remember what they're called, but they basically are kind of shaped like they've got like a ball at the top and then they, they have like a point at yeah, the end, know, you know, you know it's kind of a long, real pretty elegant looking ornament. And, um, so anyway, so, so my friend and her grandmother-in-law used to swap ornaments every year. And so we're at this ornament party and, and my friend's grandmother-in-law had died like two or three years beforehand. Um, and so anyway, so we're at the party and she's up there describing all the different ornaments or whatever. And so the one that she opened looked like one of these ornaments that she used to um, swap with, with who she called grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so I said in front of like 55 people in the room, I was like, oh, I said, did you get that one from grandmother this year? Thinking... I just made like a really cool connection oh, totally. with her because like she knows that I know that she did this whole thing and she just looked and said, grandmother's dead in front of everyone, in front of everybody. <laughs> and so like, literally like I, like all the like pretty skinny girls in the room all like looked at me like, Oh my God. Like it was just really, I was mortified. Like my whole body was numb because I knew grandmother was dead. Oh, you did. I, I, knew, I knew she was dead, but like, I was just, I, I was see. going to make the connection. Totally. You know, it's like, Hey, did you get that from grandmother? And her go, actually, yeah, I did. You know, and everybody's like, Oh, cat knows Jenny really well, you know? And, and, but I, I, it just completely flopped and I, my body was numb for like the rest of the night. Oh, my and I gosh. got out of there the minute I could. Was there any beverages that you could consume to numb the pain? No. No, it wasn't one of those kind of parties. It was uh, like, there's hot tea. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that was pretty, pretty embarrassing to me. Yeah. What I was going for was, hey, I'm really connected with this person exactly. that's here, too. So much so that she invited me to her party with all her pretty people. And I, I felt really special. So I wanted to kind of go, hey, I belong, you know, and yeah. it just absolutely backfired on me. Wow. Sorry that happened. That's okay. I've healed it, from it's that. It's interesting because... Um, 
with my mom passing this year, a lot of people knew she was sick and stuff like that, but not everyone, not all my like work contacts mm. follow me on Facebook or mm -hmm. anything. So I have those weird conversations all the time on the phone of like, how's your mom doing? Oh, <laughs> Oh, and you're like, I, well, you know me, like, I don't know any way around to the shortest path. <laughs> so I say, oh, she's dead. Every, I mean, it's kind of like your friend and same thing. Like, I'm like, oh, she's dead. And then you just hear, cause people think I'm joking. And like, you hear this awkward pause. And I'm like, no, really? It's okay. <laughs> there's no other way around it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, well, maybe we could help each other out here. Like maybe I could not strive for connection with people who are cooler than me. And maybe you could say something along the lines of like, well, she has gone on to another place, a happier, a better place or something like that instead of just dead. Yeah. I don't and know. Maybe I could say she's gone on to a happier place. She's sitting on my desk in a golden urn. All right, Moose. So if you could only have five musical projects that you could listen to for the rest of your life, what would be your top five? Mercy. All right. I would go with uh, Whitney Houston. I don't know the name of the project, but it's the one with I Want to Dance with I Somebody. I Want to Dance with Somebody. One of my top songs ever. I want to feel the That hit. record. I would go with... Michael Jackson, black and white record. Mm, that's a great record. Um, I would go with Wilson Phillips, self-titled. Mm -hmm. I love every song on that album. I love every... Well, track number eight, Ooh, Your Gold, is is a dud in my opinion. But Ooh, I is enough. No, that's not the right song. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. I know that song. Yeah, I don't like it either. Bum, 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 bum. Like the, the bass line, everything, it just, meh. I, I feel like that was a miss. But Glenn Ballard, who produced that project, that I mean, that is a bang-up project. Who is the guy who produced my next album? Which would be Jagged, Jagged Little, Little Pill, Pill, which is on Broadway now. So, um, and then, man, I mean, I got to go with Brandy Carlisle, but can I have a bonus record? Mm-hmm. And then Tori Amos, Little Earthquakes. Mm. Such a good record. Such a great record. Yep. Those are great choices. Thank you. Okay, I'm asking you the same question. What are your top five? My top five of all time. I think that I would say the Adele record that Hello yes. is on. I, I don't remember. Is, is that 25? Is that the title of it's that record? It's the latest one. Yeah, the latest one. Um, definitely that Adele record. I love that record. The Wilson Phillips record, absolutely. Um, I absolutely am just nuts. So, and I'm so sad this year she passed away. Um, Roxette, Marie oh, yeah. Fredrickson from Roxette passed away, um, kind of over the holidays. Um, their Joyride record, I just absolutely stink and love it. And, um, Sarah McLaughlin's Fumbling Towards Ecstasy. I yes, love that, that record. That record is great. So is Mirrorball. Yeah, I like it. That's a live one though, isn't it? Is Mirrorball the live I one? I don't think so. Oh, okay, because I don't, I don't, I mean, I love her live, but I don't like listening to live records very much. Um, and probably uh, Bruce Springsteen, Born in the USA. Yeah, that's, that's just a great amazing. record. Is that five? Yeah. Yep. Well, can we throw some Tom Petty in there too? Oh my gosh, Full Moon Fever. Yes. Best Tom so Petty record. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, I didn't discover Tom Petty until I was in college and I heard him on the radio. And, um, I, there was no Shazam back then. So I like Googled the lyrics or something and found it was Tom You're Petty. acting like there was Google back then. <laughs> hey, there was. I don't think well, I don't so. think it was Google. Not when you were in college. Maybe Dogpile was that one. <laughs> <laughs> Dogpile or, um, um, what were the others called? Yahoo. Uh, anyway. Um, but or, I. Or Chum Hum, the fake one that they use on The Good Wife. Ask Jeeves. Ask Jeeves. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. Oh my God. Why does that kind of stuff make us laugh so much? Um, Sarah, I, do you think you could find the AOL dial up sound to include somewhere in oh, here? That would idea. be amazing. So good. Um, okay. So I asked Jeeves. Who is this? <laughs> and I'm not even kidding. I think I had $130 or 
in my bank account for my rent, my part of the rent in college. Mm-hmm. And I went to the record store and I bought every Tom Petty record that they yep. had, yep. which I remember was four records that they had on hand. And I just, I just listened to him one I mean, after the so other. So good. He's so such good. a good writer, such a good guitar player, such a brilliant musician. Yeah. My gosh, those records are, are amazing. Another really, really significant loss oh, no kidding. In, in our industry in the past decade for yep. sure. Oh, can we talk about that? Then there's Prince. Let's talk about who we've lost in the past decade in the entertainment industry, specifically music, who we've lost that is, has just absolutely crushed us. Well, Prince was hard for me. I, I, I was a fan at a certain time and then I didn't kind of follow him after that, but it's just so sad too. Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh, uh, and then Michael Jackson was hard because it's like, he's such an icon, He's such an icon. But then you're also like, you feel bad. I don't really, but some people feel bad it's continuing to like his art, knowing what could have been happening. Right. Um, and Netherland, mm-hmm. Netherland <laughs> and, and Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> and the, knowing what happened in the Netherlands, it's really, really I mean, sad. <laughs> I didn't know he was Dutch. I had no clue that he was Dutch until after he passed away. I think it's Neverland. I, I think for me, the, a couple that have been really hard for me, George Michael. Yeah. Like took me out for about a day. I didn't because know he was I, dead. <laughs> yeah. He died. Seriously. Yeah. He died. Yeah. Just this uh, in the past, like couple of years. What? And I just think that he has got the most, Oh my gosh. And another one, Michael Hutchins. That's probably been in the past 20 years from NXS. Oh, okay. Like him and George Michael, their voices are out of this world amazing i love george michael yeah me too and i always i used to sit on my bed and just fantasize about him kissing me when i was a teenager really i did i i thought he i still think he's such a beautiful man that's how i felt about michael jackson (laughs) did you really yeah i had um remember like the teen bop magazine oh yeah or teen beat maybe Mm mm-hmm Oh my God. I would beg for it. Like full on throw a fit laying on the grocery <laughs> store floor. Like I need tiger beat, you know? And my mom would just throw the magazine at me to shut me up. But there was, it would have like new kids on the block and like Corey exactly. Haim and like, yeah. And so, uh, there was one that had like a four page spread of MJ mm-hmm. and I was like, must buy. So is I, this before or after the plastic surgery? Oh, before okay. this is like when he was like, he, he almost looks childlike. St- mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. he had like the really curly hair. Uh-huh. Um, but I had that picture of him. Uh, would it have been bad with the red leather jacket? Black leather. Yeah. yeah. No red leather. Oh, red leather. Mm. Oh, I'll find it. But anyway, I had a picture of him from the magazine pasted on my wall. I was on the upstairs bunk beds mm-hmm. and I had a bunch of pictures, but the one right next to my head was Michael Jackson and I would kiss it every night before I went to <laughs> That's bed. That's amazing. I That's would. so sweet. That's so sweet. I also, at one point years later, um, I was a huge fan of Donnie Wahlberg and new kids on the block. Mm-hmm. And I put his poster on my ceiling so I could go to bed looking at him. Mm. Cause well, he was the bad boy. Remember? I do. I do totally remember that. So I went to a new kids on the block concert. Did I did you, too. It's my you? first concert. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I went and I remember that in one part of the concert, it snowed. Like they made it snow and it was, um, and it was like little styrofoam balls. You know, the ones that you like, when you open a package, they just stick to you everywhere and you can't get rid of them. And I remember I was so excited about the fact that it snowed inside the arena at a new kids on the block show that the cup I had my Coke in or my diet Coke or whatever it was I was drinking. Um, I emptied it out and I scooped up a whole cup of the snow (laughs) and I kept it for years. And it was just, it was just a cup full of those styrofoam balls. And in every time it would get like on the chopping block, it's like, it's time to throw this away. It's a cup of styrofoam. I'm like, no, like that came from the sky. That is really cool. New kids that you on the block that. concert. Yeah. That is so neat. Okay. So this is the photo I'm talking about of Michael. He's that's wearing the thriller. It's thriller. I didn't mm-hmm. realize that. Yeah. He's wearing, this isn't the exact photo, but that's the jacket. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's cool. Cause jacket. I think on the cover of the bad record, he's wearing all black leather. And then the only thing on that cover that's red is the word bad. Oh, you're right. That's yep. I, I, Look at the back of that jacket. It's so ooh, cool. Yeah, that's tight. Okay, so I feel like this is an appropriate time for you to tell your Wilson Phillips story. Oh, gosh. Which, which part of it? I think the phone call. 
The phone call. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I was, and still am a huge Wilson Phillips fan. They just really, really impacted me growing up. And they were the reason that I wanted to work in the music business. And I still credit them for being the reason I do work in the music business. And, um, so much like what you're talking about, like I would get all the magazines, like, you know, everything from Tiger Beat to Billboard to R&R that still existed at the time. And anything that was about them or about their record label or about anything that had to do with them, I would read the article and then I would cut it out and I would put it on my wall. So I had literally like wall to wall collages of all things Wilson Phillips. And it was a time where record stores were really still big, you yeah. know, like tower records. Um, and so I would go to the, we lived in the Washington DC area at the time. And I would go to our local tower records and I knew the guy there. And every time he saw me, he was, he would point over to this whole stack where they would have promo posters, you know, that they got to put oh, on the walls wow. and stuff like that. So I would dig through it and I would get, you know, any of the Wilson Phillips stuff I could find and, and all of that. So one of the things I did during that time in my life, I think I did it for about three years is I wrote Carney Wilson. She, she was my favorite Wilson Phillips character. Um, and she's the one that does all their harmony arangements and, mm. um, has struggled with weight her whole life. And I, I just, I really like her story, you know, her yeah. struggle with her dad and, and all of that. And, um, and so for about three years of my life, I wrote her a letter once a week. I would write it, I think like on Fridays or something like that. And I would put it in the mail and I would always start the letter the same because I thought if somebody reads one of my letters and then maybe stumbles upon another one. They'll be like, Hey, we know this kid. Mm -hmm. I don't know why my logic was that, but I would say, um, I would say, hi, Carney. Um, uh, my name is Kat Davis and I want to drive a yellow Honda CRX. <laughs> so I would start every letter exactly like that. Wait, you actually did want a yellow? I, oh my, I still want a yellow Honda CRX. Well, like, my I think, goodness. I think they're the cutest cars in the world. And I, I wanted one, like I would, fantasize about owning one of those cars anyway so I'd start my letter that way and I had met this friend that worked at her record label um at a at a in-store signing or something and he gave me his business card and he would let me call him every week on Friday at 3 15 and I could talk to him and ask him any question I wanted to about the music business for 15 minutes and so this guy was so sweet. He would send me letterhead from the record label and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, I'm definitely going to get her attention now because I'm sending to her fan club a letter to her on record label stationery. Like, surely that this is, is so legit. cool. He did that with you. Yeah, it was, it was so kind of him. Um, and he's still in our industry today and we're Facebook friends, which is cool. Um, so anyway, so I wrote her letter after letter after letter after letter. And uh, my parents had separated at this time. I was probably... 15. And I was at my dad's house and my sister was at my mom's house and my sister calls my dad's house and she's like in hysterics. And I'm like, what is going on? And she's like, Carney called you. And I said, Oh my God. Okay. Like what, what are you saying? Carney called you. I'm like, what do you mean? Carney called me. I just got off the phone with her. And I said, well, what did she say? And she goes, well, I asked, I asked her, she was there with Wendy. And I said, Oh my God, she was there with Wendy. Like she had two thirds of Wilson Phillips on the phone. <laughs> right. What did you say? And she goes, I asked him if they ate at McDonald's. Oh my gosh. I don't remember. That. <laughs> I said, you what? And she goes, I asked them if they ate at McDonald's and Wendy said, we're normal people. And yes, we've eaten at McDonald's. And she said, well, do you have hardwood floors or carpet on your floors? And she said, well, we have, we have hardwood floors in, in our place. And my sister's like, cool. Oh, how and crazy that those are her two questions. Those, those were her questions. She might've asked more questions, but those are the ones I remember. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Carney told her, hey, we were calling to talk to Kat. I got one of Kat's letters. And what she said really moved me. She said that she really appreciated how I had done an interview about my upbringing and my struggles with my dad and our relationship and all of that. And I had written her a very heartfelt letter saying, Hey, I'm really dealing with a lot of the same things. Yeah. So I just want you to know that like, I, I have compassion for you and what you're going through. And, but you telling your story and you being willing to share your struggles with your relationship with your dad, that, that has been so meaningful to me. It's made me not feel alone. And I just wanted to say, thank you. That's pretty much what my letter said. And so that letter made her want to call me. So she calls and And of course, you know, my sister was there, picks up the phone, asks about McDonald's, calls me at my dad's like absolutely falling apart going, Carney called. And I thought, 
like I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. So like, did I you just, ever talk to her? I did. So two weeks later, I'm babysitting for a, a kid that my mom was helping babysit or something. And, and it was the kid and it was my sister and it was me and the phone rang. And I was, it was, I was totally not expecting it because I'm like, she's, she's, she's not, not going to call, call twice, back. Yeah. you know, phone rings. I'm like, hello. And she's like, Hey, is this cat? I'm like, yeah, this is Carney Wilson. And I'm like, no, no, it isn't. She's like, yeah. And I knew her voice. Like, I, I should know her voice. I've heard every interview, every note she's ever sung, you know? Um, and we talked on the phone for about 45 minutes. We talked about our dads. We talked about their music. We talked about their harmonies. We talked about how I wanted to work in the music business. It was the most normal, delightful conversation. And it absolutely changed my life. I know it did. Absolutely changed my life because I thought, you know, it's for people like that that I want to work behind the scenes. I yeah. want to help people like her get to do more things like that, whatever mm -hmm. that looks like, because it really was a, it was an absolute game changer for me. And, and over the years I've gotten to work kind of loosely with them on a couple of things. And I've gotten to go to a bunch of shows and hang out backstage and, and all of that kind of stuff. Like I still, my favorite picture on my screensaver is my one that's you know, at a show here in Nashville that they did a few years ago. Well, um, let's be clear. You're kind of downplaying. I mean, at one point you were managing China Phillips. I was. That's incredible. Yeah. Like, it I was think awesome. that's like, I don't know if it's, you know, I think it's a, like God giving you a little wink, like, Hey, oh, totally. And I, who knows what you could do in the future with Carney. Oh, I, I would be so thrilled. I think she's brilliant and hilarious and she is. you know, their big comeback to me was when they were on the bridesmaids yeah. movie, you know, it's like, everybody was like, Oh my God, it's actually Wilson Phillips. And then everybody thought they were cool. So then it was cool that I have still to this day, a Wilson Phillips poster in my office that people have made fun of for years. And now they're like, man, that's so cool. That's like legit. And I'm like, yeah, it's legit. It's a, promo poster their first record that was like the record that i felt like for the first time that music like could change me like yep. i remember listening to every single song and like i had my own story for each of those songs mm -hmm. i knew every single lyric i mean it was all my sister hated it like my wilson phillips is her phil collins <laughs> like we both we listen like my sister was in the phil collins fan club which i have no idea how because we were poor. I mean, we couldn't even eat meat in our spaghetti. <laughs> and she was in the Wilson Phillips fan club. I think my mom did it for a birthday gift or something. Well, I mean, we were poor too. And I was in the Wilson Phillips fan club yeah. and the rock set fan club, which means we have awesome parents. We have amazing parents. That Thank you. Mom. Are, you know, that are like yep. willing to go like, okay, we may not eat, but you're going <laughs> to, <laughs> you're going to get a little plastic card that says you belong to your favorite artist fan club. You paid $25 for a card. <laughs> We're not sure what it gets you. I am but. a card carrying fan. <laughs> well, what does that do for you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> do you think that there are, I mean, like, you know, there's musicians who have like, you know, Gaga has, you know, her fan club. Her little monsters, right? Right. Um, and so, then like Third Day has the Gomers. Isn't that Third Day's no fan idea. club? Yeah. But do you think they're as rabid as we were as kids? I, I don't know. I, I feel like, I feel like only I had that moment, you know, like yeah. I feel like that, that was a time that nobody had the kind of experience that I did. The reality is, is a lot of people had that experience and they probably still are having that experience. You yeah. know, I just don't know. I yeah. don't know. It doesn't, it feels like with the evolution of the internet and social media and stuff like that, it's a little bit easier to be closer to your celebrity people. Like I have a really close friend who follows Justin Bieber and she like knows about his entire life because she follows him on social media. Like if I could have followed Wilson Phillips back in the day, that's what I was saying. Oh like, my God. Like the ability to know what's actually going on in their life mm -hmm. now, because we have social media, well, we have the internet <laughs> because back then it was like, your only access to these people before the internet was Teen Beat Magazines. or Tiger. Magazines and MTV and VH1. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, I've got an MTV story. Let's hear it. Okay, so um, we never had cable growing up. Like, I, I'm a huge supporter to this day of public TV because <laughs> we got like four channels, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and anyway, so when I started becoming a teenager, my mom decided like, we're going to get the basic cable package, which mm -hmm. was like, the family Christmas present or whatever. And so, um, so, uh, she came home and I was in the front room of the house 
watching Madonna like a prayer video. Oh, the one with the burning crosses. Yeah. Scandalous. Now, let me, my mom was not someone that is like religious or anything like that. Like that wouldn't naturally be offensive to her, but something about that meant that there was no morality in our home. Mm. And Bonnie walked over and tore that cable out of the wall. (laughs) I'm not kidding. There was drywall. We rented. We rented. This wasn't even our own house. But she walked in and she dropped her purse after work and I'm dancing to it, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, like a prayer. And my mom like comes over the whole like casing around the cable unit comes out of the wall, white dust everywhere. Oh my gosh. And we didn't have cable after that. I'm so sorry. So I blame Madonna for all of my issues. So yeah, I was pretty sheltered after that. I I think I got like four videos in. It was right when we got it. And I was like, I was just, it was the best thing ever. And I would have to go to friends' houses to watch it. Yeah. Best thing ever. I remember, (laughs) I remember I got stuff in the mail offering for me to, well, I would watch stuff on TV and I would, I would write a letter to whoever it was and they would send me a catalog and I would save up my money because I delivered newspapers at that age. That was my job because I wasn't old enough to have like a real job. And I delivered newspapers and I saved money from that. And I bought the sateen MTV jacket. No way. It was way. black sateen with the MTV logo on it. And I thought I was wearing a royal That robe. is really cool. Oh, I thought it was so cool. I wish I still had it. Yeah. Um, do you remember Columbia house? Can we oh, just, yes. Oh my God. CD clubs. Uh, Talk to me no, about, but they were tapes when I was first in well, it. Well, That's true. You know, yeah. like cassette tapes. I don't even know if I ever had a CD club, but that, and then you, you have to declare bankruptcy cause you owe them like $300. <laughs> Like nobody, it's a, like the, the, but packaging, you get 10 records for a penny. It was 10 records for one set. And mm-hmm. you're like, Oh my God. Like the music industry just landed on my house. I have arrived in Mecca. Like, How is this possible? You don't read the fine print. Not at all. Nor do you ask your family if you can sign up for this. (laughs) Right. Are you a minor? I don't even know what that is. I don't know. (laughs) Just check it. What do you want me to do? I need my records for one set. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like when people sign you up for, you know, like a free trial or whatever. And then they get like HelloFresh or something like that. I just, I can't eat. We signed up for toilet paper delivery <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's the best toilet paper I've ever changed. It's going to change your life. And I'm like, you know what? Let's try I need this. It. Yeah, I need it. Let's try the shit. So we, I put in my stuff. I can't even log in anymore. They don't have my account. <laughs> they keep charging my card and I have been on this toilet paper plan for a year. Is the toilet paper amazing? It, it's good. Is it's it like- not amazing, and I can't turn it off. <laughs> the thing is like thirty six dollars a month, and you just get a shit. Like ton every of time it shows up, I'm like, God. <laughs> <laughs> me okay. and then they don't there's no account i like call and i'm like is that under this name is there can you look it up under my social security number i want to cancel this they're like we don't have any record of you i'm like well you're charging me can i give you my address no i need your account <laughs> number like no i don't have my toilet paper account number like no. but they're still charging your credit card that's a racket it's, it's a, like <laughs> it's like trying to cancel your membership at the ymca have oh. you ever tried oh, to do that yes and then you think you've done a good deed. And then like a week later, you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, you fat. <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to piss I'm gonna, myself. I'm going to go back to the YMCA and they charge you $150 to sign back up. That is what I do four times a year. Every quarter I quit. And then I see myself and I get back in the gym. Woo, Kat had to leave the microphone to use the restroom <laughs> on that one. I just, I wish I had some peach toilet paper in there. Oh man, we need That's to get the only sponsored. Thing that <laughs> I, love, I mean, I'll let me be clear. I love this toilet paper, but 
I just think it's bizarre that I have had this and I can't turn it off. It's not that I want, <laughs> don't want it. So peach toilet paper, if you want to come. Okay. Sponsor. It makes me think of something though. I went to a friend's house this past week who had painted her common bathroom. I think her, ba- her house has like two bathrooms, yeah. but the one that like, if you come over as a guest, the one that you use, she painted all black, which I've never seen that before and had a black toilet and had black toilet paper. Have you ever seen black toilet paper? No, I didn't even know it existed. I didn't either. And I I went in there and I said, oh my God. I said, is this real? And she goes, what do you mean? And I said, is this real toilet paper? And she was like, well, of course it is. And I said, where did you get it? And she's like, Kat, you can buy all colors of toilet paper on Amazon. And I'm like, my mind was literally blown. Right now I'm like, we can add colors to our toilet. I mean, I don't know (laughs) if I can go away from my peach though. But is it peach colored? No, it's, it's just called, but it peach. has, you know, it's got some grooves in it to catch things. And so it's, <laughs> it's like em, embossed. <laughs> the toilet paper is embossed with images of peaches. Oh, I'll so br- I'll bring, I'll bring, yeah, uh, toilet. bring, bring some of your peach toilet paper here to the office. We, we could certainly use it. Okay. So you asked me about my story about Wilson Phillips. I would love for you to share your hero story. Well, um, I I usually intend not to meet my heroes because you're disappointed. Dolly Mm -hmm. would be one of those. I stalked Dolly, not literally, but I used to go, uh, her little complex Mm -hmm. is over on 12 South Mm -hmm. in Nashville. And there's a restaurant across the street that I would eat lunch at almost every day. And the whole point was for me to see a glimpse of her. But now I I actually think she is one of a very few celebrities who would not disappoint. I agree with if that. If you met her. 100%. I, I totally agree with that. I, I'm about to tell you a story that you'll understand why I don't want to meet her. <laughs> okay. So um, growing up, we, we remember that I only had like network stations on TV and, um, and public TV. So um, one of the shows that I absolutely loved was Touched by an Angel. My sister was- Oh, like, man. Remember what was the show about heaven with Michael Landon? Oh, I don't remember the name of that, but I know exactly what you're talking about. That was my sister's show. And then I had touched by an angel. Okay. And I just thought it was, um, it's, I'm sure it's like super dorky, but no, I mean, it's like the TV version of guide posts, his mysterious ways. (laughs) I don't even know what that is. Okay, Guidepost Magazine. It's like this Christian oh, magazine. Yeah. That, oh, it's Christian. Yeah, yeah. My my family has subscribed to it since the beginning of time. Okay. And it's kind of like Reader's Digest, but for Christians. Oh, yeah. Okay. And they have a segment called His Mysterious Ways. And, oh. it, and it always tells a story about how like, you know, I was driving my car and I hit the side rails and I was going to go over the cliff, but then like an angel came and lifted my car. Exactly. And it's that kind of thing. So, so. Touched by an Angel is like the TV version of of that. So yeah, go and on. I need to look up like what years that was on because I think it was like in that time frame where, you know, like you're searching for something spiritually. And mm-hmm. I just, I remember just loving that show. I think because it just ended with a happy ending. So uh, I never thought it was corny that that light would come behind her head. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, anyway, all that to say, Roma Downey yeah. is, is the angel, one of the angels. And um, I just loved her. I thought- her and her red hair and mm-hmm. her angelness was just <laughs> everything that I needed in life. So a huge fan, huge fan, huge fan. Years later, um, come around uh, and she's showing up at this industry event that I'm a member of. And, um, and you can this- say it. You were at a Grammy party. Okay. Yeah. So I was at a Grammy party and she happened to be there. Mm-hmm. And, um, and a friend of mine, everyone knows how big of a Dolly fan I am and how big of a Roma Downey fan that I am. And so, um, so my friend who runs this event, she grabs me and she's like, Hey, you need to go say something to her. And I was like, Nope, Nope, Nope. I know myself that is not (laughs) happening. I'm not going to do it. And she's like, no, come over. Well, next thing you know, they knew I wasn't going. So they brought her over. So they brought, okay. They brought Roma Downey to me, to you. Yeah. So I, but I don't know it. Right. And so all of a sudden I get this tap on my shoulder and she's like, it's like this life-size angel. There she is. <laughs> and you guys, this is what happens. I gasped. I have pictures of this that we'll have to put on our Instagram. I have, my friends were just snapping pictures. 
I have, uh, so I, 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 I gasp and I put my hands on her shoulders and I said, you don't understand. <laughs> I love you. I love you. Oh my God. I love you. And <laughs> my friend who set it up was standing behind her and she's shaking her head and, and doing the like, cut it on your neck move. Like stop. And so <laughs> I literally am like, uh, I can't stop saying I'm love you to the point that she puts her hands on my shoulders. So we're almost embracing one another. <laughs> and she said, thank you. And I said, I have more to say, but I can't say it right now. <laughs> and, um, and so she hugs me and I have that on, I have that picture as well. We hu she hugs me and she said, I just think you're darling. And then she got swooped away to somebody else. And I'm standing there. My body goes cold and I'm like, what have you done? <laughs> because I know all the episode numbers. I know mm -hmm. the names of these episodes. I could have easily like blown her mind with my touch by an angel trivia. Yeah. No, nah, I just kept saying, I, I love, love you. you. <laughs> I love you. I, oh my God, I love you. So I'm pretty sure she actually got swooped away by security because they got nervous. Me being a fan. Well, I mean, you were touched by an angel. <laughs> Okay, so do you have any more stories of, um, I mean, like, I think we both were kind of stalkers uh, with, with fans. Do you have any that stuff? Yeah, I do have a stalker story. Um, so Opryland, before it became a, a outlet mall, yeah. um, Opryland was actually a theme park here in Nashville. And, and now they have a water park there, which I hear is just amazing. And um, so anyway, we were at the theme park and there was a show that night that my mom was taking me and my sister to, and it was none other than Tanya Tucker. And everybody needs to see Tanya Tucker. Oh my goodness. Multiple yes. times in your life. And so growing up, I used to make it my goal to sneak backstage at shows that we would go to. I just felt like this is important to me. This is the business I'm going to work in. I need to learn how these people operate, how they live, how they do life on the road. And so I, I would dress like a roadie kind of in all black. Oh I would make a gosh. fake backstage pass that resembled something that had to do with the artist. And I would just act like I knew what I was doing. I went backstage at Tina Turner. I went backstage at George Michael. I went backstage at Roxette. Like I would sneak backstage and try to meet these people and most of the time get kicked out. But every now and then I would like achieve the prize. Like That's I would amazing. Oh, I, I, I still do it, but now I'm, it's cause I'm supposed to be there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, um, and so at this Tanya Tucker show, my mom and my sister looked at me like, well, I mean, are you going to do your thing? And I'm like, well, of course I'm going to do my thing, you know? So I sneak backstage and I, I follow the signs that the tour manager has like pointed toward catering and dressing rooms and stuff like that. And I, I bust into Tanya Tucker's dressing room. I'll never forget. She was wearing a red sequin dress and her blonde hair was as big as the sun mm. itself. Yeah. And I said to her, I said, Hey, Tanya Tucker. And she said, well, Hey, and I said, I need your autograph. And she goes, well, oh, okay. And, and, and she was like, well, who are you? And I said, it doesn't matter. I'm not supposed to be back here. I just need you to sign my piece of paper so I can get out of here. So I don't get kicked out. And she goes, well, you're a brassy little thing, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am. I am. She gave me her autograph and I left. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. She is such a legend. She said, you're a brassy little thing. And I said, well, whatever. I didn't even know what that meant. I but, love that phrase. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start using you brassy it. Little that is thing. so cool that you snuck back. So who else did you, have you met? Uh, Pear Gessel from Roxette. Really? Yeah. My sister and I, I, she snuck backstage with me and we were at the Fox Theater in Atlanta and we climbed up all 59 flights of stairs to, we were following the, you know, here's yeah. catering and here's dressing rooms and pair guessels up this way. And so we, we got all the way up to his dressing room, did just like I did with Tanya Tucker, walked right in and said, Hey, we're not supposed to be here. Huge fans. What's up. And the only thing that my sister and I both really remember from that is there was one of those like Kroger veggie trays that had carrots in it and cucumbers and stuff. And he offered us vegetables, which was so kind. <laughs> so we each like ate a carrot. We're like, now we're eating a carrot with pear guessel from Roxette. How cool is that? And he shook both of our hands and my sister and I both remember how soft they were. Wow. You know, and he's a guitar player. So you wouldn't think he would really have super soft hands, but his hands, his hands were really soft. It's amazing. I think that's amazing. You guys did that. Yeah. It was pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, speaking of Tanya Tucker, I just recently was at the Ryman, uh, to see Brandy Carlisle. 
And she had six sold out nights at the Ryman. Oh my gosh, that's epic. That is so awesome. It was so sweet because I went to the first night because Kim Ritchie was opening. Mm -hmm. She's one of my favorite songwriters in town. And I had no idea their connection. Obviously, Brandy handpicked. And each night had a different opener. And and when she when Brandy came out after Kim played, she stood out there and, and she, you could tell she legitimately was so overwhelmed mm-hmm. that that place was packed. And, and she said, you guys, this is a dream of mine. Never mm-hmm. did I once think that I would pack out with the Ryman, nor do six, you know, or mm-hmm. do six actual nights. And then she told the story. Or she even said... I was happy with third and Lindsley. It's like so sweet. Uh, Don't you you remember you and I saw her there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, but then she told a story about how um, that Kim Ritchie was one of her heroes and, you know, Brandy's known for her yodeling and the Mm -hmm. way the vibrato and her vocal. And she said only two women do what's called some, it's like almost like a backwards vibrato or something like that. And that's where Brandy learned it from. Really? Kim Ritchie. That's so cool. And Kim's like in her 60s now. Mm-hmm. And she's been a, obviously a very um, successful songwriter. But it was really sweet for her to honor Kim back. Yeah. And they became friends because Kim stalked or because Brandy stalked Kim. Really? They became friends. And so when Brandy started getting popular, Kim wrote her back, started writing her back and saying like, hey, thank you so much for this. So it was beautiful to see that relationship. That's so cool. And then I was hoping the high women were going to come out during Brandy's set, but instead Tanya Tucker came out. Did she really? Oh my gosh. I about fell over and she sang on one of Brandy's songs. And then uh, Tanya is just so spunky, you know, and at one point, so Brandy produced her record, her latest record. Oh, really? Okay. So Tanya is a huge influence on Brandy's life. So Brandy actually said, Tanya, do you want to make a record together? And Tanya basically said on stage, if it weren't for uh, Brandy and the twins, who are her two guitar players, uh, she said, I wouldn't be sitting here right tonight. Really? Yeah. And, and Brandy was like, oh, you don't have to give me that credit. And she was like, I'm not kidding. And so she walks over, she's like, I need something to drink. And she walks over, picks up the drink that Brandy's been drinking. It's like a, you know, an insulated gl- cup and uh, it could be wine. It could be water. It could be whiskey. She chugs it back. She goes, I hope this is whiskey. She chugs it back. She goes, oh, what is that? She even asked to take a drink <laughs> of it. And Brandy's just on the piano getting ready for their next song, <laughs> dying laughing. She's like, this is what it was like writing with her. <laughs> so it was a really sweet moment of seeing women support one another and then of course the show is unbelievable yeah i love that and i love that you got to go to the first night how special so cool that's really cool didn't you just recently go to celine oh yes i'm a huge celine dion fan and my aunt mary mac is as well and um i heard actually you told me she was coming to town and because I don't really use the internet very much, so I didn't know that she was <laughs> coming to town. It wasn't in the I, newspaper? I, I, no, but uh, well, I read in Billboard magazine that her record, her Courage record, debuted at number one. And I think it was her 20th record that debuted at number one on the Billboard charts. And she hasn't released a new project in over 20 years. And she still debuted at number one. What do you mean she hasn't released a project in 20 years? Or maybe it's the 20th time. I, I don't know. But yeah. there was some statistic where they were going like, Celine is really She's amazing incredible. because yeah, yeah, she yeah. is still able to do this after all this time. So um, so you had told me she was coming to town. So I went on StubHub and I bought the best tickets. We were sitting literally like eyeball to eyeball from Celine Dion on one of her catwalks. So I she saw would, your videos and I was blown away. She walked out there and we were like, my aunt and I were just, I mean, chins on the floor screaming like little children. So excited to see Celine Dion. And the thing that, that I remember most from that show. And I was telling my aunt Mary Mac this is I said, I felt like I was the only person in the room mm. And like, she was talking to me the whole night. Wow. She has such a beautiful way of communicating that I I was inspired. I was moved. I felt heard. I felt seen. I felt appreciated that I had, you know, shown up and bought my tickets and brought my aunt, you know, it's like just the way that she communicated uh, with the whole audience was just fantastic. And I kept having these moments of going like, whoa, it's not just me she's talking to. There's 22,000 other people in here yeah. who are feeling the same way that I am. And I just really, I, I admire that level of 
of artistry and commitment and integrity and all the things that you have to have to be able to put on a show and to be able to talk to your audience like that. It was so impressive. And of course she sang all the hits. Well, I was going to say, you mentioned that, um, she basically, you could hear a pin drop when she was singing that song to her husband. Oh my gosh. Well, she sang my heart will go on the Titanic song. Oh, that was her encore. Oh my gosh. Dear God. No you can't even hear that song like on, no. on a, really crappy speaker system and not just cry, you know, much less in a big auditorium with big production. And they had all these drones that I think were meant to resemble, um, at the beginning, they were meant to resemble water because they're all these drones that had blue lights on them and they were moving up and down. So it kind of looked like waves as she was singing the Titanic song, but then through the song, they kind of became stars. So they rose up Mm. higher and they had white lights on them. So they, they were first waves and then they were stars And at the end of the song, all of the drones, I think they turned blue again and they, they came down and then they rose up, but then one came down to her hand and it literally looked like it landed on her hand and she blew a kiss at it and it shot up to the ceiling. It was the only white one and it was indicating the, the spirit of her husband that she in the past few years has lost. So it was a really moving performance. It was beautiful. That is so cool. I don't always like shows in those huge arenas. Me either. But I saw Pink there recently and felt the same way. Like she had like an entire um, uh, like Cirque du Soleil situation yeah. where uh, I went to two shows. One was on the floor really close like you were with Celine. And then I was up in the 300s on another one. And she flew all the way out to the upper deck. Oh and it gosh. just felt like she was honoring the people that had bought I tickets love that. to the upper level. Yeah. I love that. Me too. Okay, so we would love to hear your hero stories. Send us your hero stories at hello at catandmoosepodcast.com. Special thanks to our producer, Sarah Reed. To find out more, go to catandmoosepodcast.com. Production.